Morning, church. Morning again. Um, my name is Janet. Uh, today's reading comes from Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take up my yoke and, lean, and learn from me, because I'm lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Our deeper journey is all about an invitation. An invitation to know deeper. An invitation to understand deeper. An invitation to experience deeper. An invitation to listen deeper. An invitation to transform deeper. An invitation to see deeper. An invitation to feel deeper. An invitation to read deeper. An invitation to love deeper. An invitation to give deeper. An invitation to share deeper. Our deeper journey is an invitation to journey deeper with Jesus. We are a disciple-making church. Kuliso said that earlier. And this series is a discipleship journey, right? The next 12 weeks. And we are trusting God to awaken the hearts and the spirits of our people to see and to accept the invitation to say yes and then to follow with expectation and obedience. For everyone who signed up for our deeper journey, quick note, the sermon texts of this series will complement, right, the nine deeper journey sessions that will be presented and taught by Josie. Here's what I want you to hear today. Tune your ears. I want you to hear an invitation from Jesus. Nothing more and nothing less. An invitation from the risen Jesus, right? The Almighty, the Savior, the Messiah, right? That Jesus is inviting you today. And according to our teaching text, here's what he's inviting you to. And these are also the three points of my sermon today. You are invited to, check this, come to Jesus and receive rest. You are invited to follow Jesus and find rest. You are invited to take an easy yoke and a light burden from Jesus. Fam, we hear so many things every single day. Our lives are filled with sounds, with messages, with marketing, with noise, with meaningless dialogue, with spin and lies, with conjecture, with bad news, and with fake news. Our lives are way too full with all of these things every single day. If we would go completely silent now, most of us would either take between 10 to 20 minutes to really just be quiet, because your mind, your heart, and your being is crammed full of stuff. Or it feels slammed by all the stuff that's going on in your life. So it's either going to take us 10 to 20 minutes to actually become really quiet, or you'll just go to sleep immediately. If we could go completely quiet now. So that your brain can clean up and empty the recycled bin of your mind. No jokes, that's how our brain works. The lights are off, cleaning services go in to just empty out everything that's going on here. Real talk. When was the last time you heard Jesus speak to you? When was the last time you heard Jesus invite you to something more, to something deeper? To something intimate. Here's the good news. Jesus has an invitation for you today. And it is an invitation to something that you long for. And that is rest. You know you want it. 
and you know you desire it. You know that you long for an easy yoke and for a light burden. Jesus is inviting you to that today. Now this invitation is for both the believer and the non-believer. So I need everyone to tune your ears, to open your hearts, to open your minds, and in the end, to decide if you are going to accept this or not. Because the decision will be put to you. It's only three verses. They're loaded though. And we're going to work through them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we heard you inviting us multiple times this morning. We know that you have what we need. We know that we desperately need rest. We know that we desperately need an easy yoke and a light burden. May we see this morning clearly that that is to be found in you. And may we accept the invitation this morning to come to you and then to follow you and to take up your easy yoke and your light burden. Lord Jesus, may we see these verses as we've never seen them before. May your name be glorified in every word we say. May we have soundness of mind and presence of mind in this moment to hear you clearly. May your spirit work in us. May your name be praised, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the portion of Scripture right before this one had some serious judgment in it. Okay? Jesus was pronouncing judgment on certain towns. And then after he pronounced judgment on certain towns for not hearing his teaching, for not accepting who he is, then he spoke about that his truth will be revealed to some and his truth will be concealed to some. Some will believe and some won't believe. It's a really hard portion of Scripture, really, if you read verses 20 to 27. And then comes this beautiful invitation, which in the context of Matthew 11 is surprising and it is comforting because Jesus was speaking some really, really hard but truthful words in the portion just before this one. The invitation to discipleship indicates that the door is still open. And all remain invited. Do you guys see that? So judgment on certain cities. Jesus saying that only kids will believe him because they trust before they think and doubt. Some won't because they doubt and think. And then they don't trust. But then he says the invitation is still open for anyone to come. So maybe let's just back up a bit and look at Matthew as a whole. I want to show you this map of the Bible project. It's way too much info for you, right? To really get a grip on it in only a few seconds. But if you follow my finger to the southwest where there's a high pressure system, then you'll see where we are. Okay, so check this. Matthew starts by connecting Jesus to the Old Testament, saying he's the continuation of the story of God and his people. And then it describes in three chapters what this new kingdom that this new king is bringing will look like. And then it shows in chapters 8 to 10 uh, what this kingdom looks like when it enters the lives of people. And then you find this portion, 11 to 13, that is all about responses to Jesus. Some people respond positive, yay, he's the Messiah. Some people neutral, I don't quite know. And some people saying that can't be the Messiah. It's definitely not him. So negative responses. That's where we are now, because Matthew 11, 28 to 30, sit right in here. So it's part of a collection that Matthew put there to show us how people responded to Jesus. And that's why in chapter 11, Jesus is saying, you need to respond. And if you didn't, judgment will come on you. If you're still considering response, you need to become a kid again. But let me, let me just say the invitation again. And then we find this portion of scripture. Nowhere is the invitation to follow Jesus more personal and tender than here. This passage is also unique to Matthew. This, pa this passage is not found in Mark, Luke, or John. It's only found in Matthew. The first two parts are parallel in content. Their form differs, but they present a similar invitation and the same accompanying response. And then the third part provides further reason to respond to the invitation. So let me just show you this. It's really easy, just a couple of highlights. We'll get back to them as we take it verse by verse. If I can have the next slide and so forth, I will be 
really glad and filled with joy. Okay, I'll speak before the slide comes. So you've got come and take. There you go. Come and take. That's similar. And then you've got I will and you will. And you've got rest and rest. Okay, so two verses. Parallel in content. They differ in form. And then, do you guys remember when we were kids and it was school holiday, there wasn't a lot of stuff to watch on telly, right? Because we didn't have DSTV or Mnet. So we used to watch infomercials. Do you guys remember that? So they would show you the new Bissell, big green clean machine. And then right before you call, they say, but wait, there's more. If you call now, and then they throw in a bonus. Verse 30 is a bonus. Verse 30 is a bonus. So come and take, I will and you will, but wait, there's more. There's something that is, and there's something that is, and that is what you'll find. Okay? So that's these three verses in terms of form. Let's jump in and look at only the first one. So in so if we can have only verse 28 on the screen, I'll be glad. Jesus has previously given an invitation to discipleship with these words, Come after me, in chapter 4, verse 19. But only here... In all the New Testament, do we find the direct invitation, come to me. Do you see it? Nothing else. Come to me. And Jesus continues through this invitation to call all people to himself. This is Israel and anyone else. Now this invitation of Jesus in the context of Matthew 11 is offered in particular to those who are laboring and bearing burdens, right? Those who are weary and burdened. These are not the disciples of Jesus, right? So the 12 that Jesus has, the 72 that he's sent out, and possibly the other 50 that's kind of around his vibe, Jesus is not talking to them. He's talking to people who are not yet his disciples, let me explain why. This is a, just a pop-up window on this side. Remember now that Jesus said to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, listen, I'm not abolishing the law. I am fulfilling it. Okay? So the purpose of the law was to guide you in your relationship with God the Father. The purpose of the law was to help you, a sinful, dirty, impure human being, to be in relationship with an almighty, ever-present, all-knowing, holy God. That was the purpose of the law. So I'm not abolishing the law, I'm just saying that I am now achieving that purpose. Right? So I am now going to be the one to guide you in your relationship with the Father. I am now going to be the one who can fix your sin and impurity problem and bring you back to a holy God. So, forget about the law. You're with me now. Jesus has said that to his disciples before. And now he's saying that to people who hasn't accepted that invitation yet. And obviously he's talking to people who are burdened, listen, with the effort to obey the law so that they can arrive at the goal of righteousness. Jesus is talking to people who says, I really want to get this right. Why? Because I want to be in right standing with God. It's important for me. I want to know that I'm forgiven. I want to know that my sins are paid for. I want to know that I live according to His will. I want to know my Creator. I want to bring glory to Him. Like I'm serious about my faith. And therefore, I'm carrying this massive burden of should not and should, cannot and cannot, will not and will. I'm, I, I, I'm in this tension of trying to be obedient so that I know that I can be okay with God. That's the people who Jesus are talking to. Now, the law in itself wasn't a burden, right? The law in itself is actually a source of delight, right? If you think of Psalm 119, oh, the word is precious. It's sweet. Oh, how much I love the word. It's like a lamp for my feet, right? So the Old Testament doesn't talk about the law as burdensome. What was the issue here is the interpretation of the law, specifically from the Pharisees, uh, placing a tremendous burden on the people by just being extra. You had a law about how to divide your spices. My word! Can you imagine? 
I've got some eggs in the pan. And you go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't just go, krr, krr, salt, Himalayan pink, krr, krr, b- black ground pepper, aromat, huh? the spice of the people. I can't do that. I have to measure it out by grams and by grains. So it was the interpretation of the law that they put on people and it was impossible to hold to it. Jesus says in Matthew 23 verse 4, They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. And then Jesus comes with this ripper, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. The Pharisees had 613 commandments. And their ruling of what was right and what was wrong had this really complicated, if this, then that. It's called casuistry. So you never knew if you got it right. And that was burdensome to the people. Now, Jesus appeals particularly to the Pharisaic scribes, particularly to the Pharisees, and particularly to their disciples. Do you guys see that Jesus invites them? Jesus doesn't flip them off? Do you guys see that Jesus is ready to embrace them? He doesn't chase them away? Jesus has a heart for people who want to get it right, but they simply cannot. And now Jesus invites them and He promises to give them rest to those who come to Him. And He speaks as Yahweh spoke to Moses in Exodus 33, 14. It's there. I've studied the Bible for a long time. I've been a pastor for a long time. I know Exodus well. And I know Exodus 30 to 36 well. I have never seen these words. But then as I was prepping this week, I thought to myself, wait, is Jesus quoting someone? Like, is Jesus using an Old Testament source in what he says? And he replied, that's God speaking, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. That's amazing! Like the Pharisees who believe in this law, who could cite this law. If you became a Pharisee at the age of seven, you were able to say Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, oh, sorry, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Like, out of your mind. Yeah, like, you could say the whole first five books. When you turn 12, you had the whole Old Testament memorized. They know this verse. And Jesus uses those words. And He calls people in the first instance, I want you to see this to Himself, and then secondly, to the yoke of discipleship. It is Jesus who gives you rest, and Jesus stands in the place of Yahweh. Can you guys see how astonishing and out of this world this must have been to the crowds? Why? Because the crowds listening to Him, and I think there's a lot of resonance with us this morning, they know they want this. The crowd that Jesus is speaking to believes in Exodus 33 verse 14. They believe in the law that Jesus speaks of. And Jesus says, you get that, in me. I give this. And I give first. There's no qualification in these three verses. It's not come to me, all of you who have, and then there's your list of achievements. It's just come to me if you're weary and burdened. You guys see how beautiful that is? Not your works, not your obedience. I know it's a hard grind for you guys, all you Pharisees and your followers. It will wear you out. And what separates Jesus from all other Jewish teachers is all other Jewish teachers would have said, I call you to obey my interpretation of the law. Jesus says, I call you to me. And now the question to these people hearing this invitation is, do you believe me? Can I ask you that question today? Do you believe Jesus? Because he says, I will. And he says, you will. And he says what his burden and his yoke is like. Do you believe him? Because that will determine your response. And that's what determined the people who he spoke to. Who he spoke to. That is what determined their response. I'll give you rest. 
It's a refreshing rest. It's a fulfillment rest. And check this, it is a rest that anticipates the rest that is to come. Let me show you a picture. This is us. Uh, that's also a series, but that's not what I'm talking about. This is us on our way to Stillbay. Family holiday, right? SUV, trailer, four bicycles, N1. What a joy. I love driving. I grew up in a house where my dad sold trucks his whole life. So I grew up with a dad on the road, and if the wheels were turning, we were in there. So I absolutely love driving. There's nothing like a road trip for me. So we always sleep in Colesburg when we drive down to Stillbay. So here's how it happens. You get to Colesburg, you get to the guest house, and then you're not quite there yet. Because once you park, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. You need to park the trailer, you need to unhook the trailer, you need to take everything out of the car, packed in a specific space that we'll only need for tonight. Then it's all about getting the kids sorted and you know, getting our place sorted. And then there's a moment where we sit down to eat. Okay, we always have a heat and eat ready when we reach Colesburg, a heat and eat of substance, because you've been snacking the whole day, right? So cottage pie, lasagna, chicken burrito, something like that, that we can hit in the microwave, but it's still a good meal. And then we sit down and eat. And after I've eaten, I always go for a shower, right? Crisp towels, bathroom smells like either pine gel or domestos, it's a lovely feeling. I am a little bit of a germaphobe. And then you take a shower, and then you get into those crackling bed sheets. It's always white, which I love, because our house cannot have white bed sheets because we've got kids. But when you get to a guest house, you're like, ooh, white, high thread count. It's beautiful. Soft mattress. That's refreshing to me. And it's fulfilling to me. Because now my stomach is full. I don't lack anything. I feel really clean. There's nothing that I need to do more. I can just slip into the bed and I can rest. It's not the end destination yet. Because tomorrow we'll do it all again. But it is a reminder of what's going to happen tomorrow night when we reach Stillbay. Our final rest and our final destination. That's what Jesus offers us. Is that kind of feeling. Does that resonate? You are invited to come to Jesus and receive rest. Let's look at the second one. You are invited to follow Jesus and find rest. Okay? I've already showed you in 28 we've got come and we've got take. And now in verse 29 it is followed with a promise giving, uh, given in the future tense referring to this rest. And there's this because part of the verse referring to the humble character of Jesus. Do you guys see it? So it's take, and it's learn, right? Two imperatives, two commands. You've got the promise, you'll find rest. But here's the reason why. is because I am lowly and humble in heart. The invitation to come to Jesus is an invitation to discipleship as well. I said firstly, to come to Him. Secondly, to follow Him and His teaching. So when Jesus invites people with the words, take my yoke upon you, he invites them to follow his own teaching as the definitive interpretation of the law. Think back of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus reinterprets the law. And he says, this is what the law is all about. So if he says, Come, uh, take my yoke, and he says, learn from me, he's talking about learn these things that I taught already. So this is a very personal commitment that you need to make. And as I was running this morning and praying for the service and praying about my sermon, I really felt that I needed to say at this point that no one can do this for you. No one can decide to take up Jesus' yoke and to learn from Him on your behalf. That's your decision, fam. Like we can pray for it. We can encourage you. We can create spaces for you to listen. We can teach our hearts out. If you are not going to choose that yourself, you will not find rest. I'm all for we and not me. I'm all for us and not I. But this is one of those moments where it's I and me. 
You really have to think about this yourself. Coming here doesn't mean that you made that decision. Listening to the podcast and attending a city group doesn't mean that you made that decision. You made that decision if you made that decision. It's yours to make. Now the reason people should take Jesus' yoke on them and learn from Him is because He's lowly and meek and humble in heart. Jesus is referred to as meek elsewhere in Matthew and in the whole New Testament only indirectly through the quotation from Zechariah 9 verse 9 in chapter 21 verse 5. I can't explain that again. Go and listen to my Palm Sunday sermon. The word humble is also applied to Jesus in the New Testament only here. It's a special portion of Scripture now, isn't it? So the word meek and the phrase humble in heart appears to be synonymous. And that is, humble to let the Father guide every single step of his life and to submit under it. That's who Jesus is. So why would you not take his yoke? Why would you not learn from him? Because he's so much different than his primary rivals, the Pharisees. Think about it, through Jesus' teaching and through what we read in the Gospels, many of the Pharisees exhibited an extraordinary pride. They loved places of honor and being VIPs. They loved their special titles and their education. They loved the general authority they exercised over others. Jesus is exactly the opposite. He's meek, he's humble, he's lowly in heart, and he says, that's why you need to take my yoke and learn from me. Because if you take their yoke and learn from them, you'll be a prideful person. You'll think you're cool. Real talk. If I was a Pharisee, I would have been able to boast in all the good things I do. There's that Pharisaic spirit inside of me. One thing to think that I'm better than Xiaomi. I mean, Xiaomi's great, but I'm, I'm, I'm just better. It's just how it is, you know? So he's worse off than I am. Any Christian struggles with that. And Jesus says, if you continue on that path, you'll just become more prideful. Follow me, who's submissive and humble. Check this. So because I found Exodus 33, 14, and I read verse 29, I was like, hmm, is Jesus quoting again? Is he using the Old Testament scriptures? He is! Check it. Jeremiah 6, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. This is Yahweh, the one we sung to earlier. Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths. Which is the way to what is good? Then take it. And Find rest for yourselves. But look at what the prophet says. But they protested. We won't. And now Jesus is saying, exactly like Yahweh was saying, if you take my yoke and you learn from me, then you will find the rest that the prophet Jeremiah was speaking about. So what Yahweh promised in the Jeremiah passage, Jesus now promises to those who come to Him and follow Him in discipleship. And what is that? That is rest. Fam, it is a, it, it is a deep, deep realization that I'm not lacking anything from anyone. It is a deep realization that I am whole and that I am at peace and that I am well. It is a deep realization that God loves me and I can do nothing to make Him love me more and I can do nothing to make Him love me less. That is shalom. Oh. Jesus fulfills what our faithful God promised. Our faithful God said that I will make it right between you and I, and Jesus fulfilled that. Our faithful God, the God of the Old Testament, is an unrelenting God. Do you guys see that He already promised this in Exodus? He promised it again in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, we read explicitly that people said no, and what did God say? Stuff you, I'm done. That's not what He did. He said, let me get involved myself. I'm going to clothe myself in flesh and blood, and I'm going to enter this world as a human being. And I will set right what is wrong. 
We have a never-changing God. Do you guys see it? Exodus, Jeremiah, Matthew, same God. Revelation 21, what will we find? Peace. Never-changing. He's a saving God. He looks at people who are lost, but they think that they're in a, in a, in a good space and on the right trajectory. And He says, I want to save you out of it. He calls people to be restored through Him, to be renewed through Him, to be redeemed through Him. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of this through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's all for us. We just celebrated that last week at Easter. You are invited to come to Jesus and receive rest. You are invited to follow Jesus and find rest. Last one. You are invited to take an easy yoke and a light burden from Jesus. Here's the key. Jesus interprets the law. And He gives the law its true meaning. And Jesus says, this interpretation of the law that I offer to you, this meaning of the law that I give to you, is kind. It is easy. What do you think is the next thing I'm going to say now? This is the only place in the New Testament where this word is used. Okay? It's the only occurrence of this word in Matthew. And then he gives us a reason and explains more what this easy yoke is like. And he explains it as a light burden. Burden occurs again in Matthew in chapter 23. I quoted that earlier. And it appears and then speaks about the requirements of the tradition of the Pharisees. And once again, it's described as heavy. Think of it as something that you have to carry. By contrast, the burden of Jesus, his interpretation of the law, is light. And to do, the only place in Matthew where this word light is used. What a special portion of Scripture. Those who follow the way of the Pharisees will work and work and work and work. And they will be heavily burdened. They will carry heavy on what is laid upon them. Those who follow the way of Jesus will have a kind yoke and a light burden. This is the best possible illustration that I can give to you. Think about a backpack. Okay? At the moment I weigh probably 67, 68. So think of loading a 50 kilogram backpack on my back. Almost my body weight. It's going to be heavy, fam. I mean, I can carry one kid here and one kid here, and I can have a camp chair over here, but it doesn't take me long to go, okay, kids, whoa, whoo, whoo, it's too heavy. Now imagine I have to carry a 50 kilogram backpack every day, everywhere I go. It's going to be heavy. Now imagine, Jesus comes up to me and says, dude, let's, let's just take off the backpack first. Just breathe. And then, let's put this 50 k's in a little trailer, and we'll make a handle for it, and then you and I can pull it together. How's that? Take my yoke. Take my burden. I'm still carrying 50 k's, but I'm receiving help from someone. And it's not wearing me down. I can go way further as we pull this little trailer together. Because we can help one another, right? We can distribute the energy. And it doesn't feel like it's wearing me down. I understand why I need to carry it. But I don't loathe every second of it. Because it doesn't hurt my neck and hurts my shoulders and makes my back all sweaty. That's what Jesus says. He says, my yoke is easy, it won't wear you out, and my burden is light. Because we do this together. What an invitation. What an invitation. So the contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees, both claim that the interpretation of the law is the actual true one, but the contrast is remarkable. Why? Because the Pharisees make it more difficult, more elaborate, and more complicated. Jesus goes directly to the heart of the law. And he says, listen, this is what it's all about. Read it with me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's it. This is the greatest and the most important command. And while I'm busy summing all of this up, the second is like it. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Fam, this is crystal clear. This isn't 613 commandments about how to pass out my spices. Love, 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 love. That's what it's all about. That's the heart of the law. So the Pharisees make it more difficult. Jesus makes it more clear. So Jesus is not only a better interpreter of the law than the Pharisees, you know, like as one rabbi among others, but Jesus has the authority that's been given to him to say, this is how things are going to be now. We are in a new time. We are in a new reality. There is a new expectation that I want you to have of me and of my presence. And there's a new response. And that response is to come to me. And that's what I want you to consider this morning. So somebody, I want to ask you to come and lead us in a song as a response. Here's what I want you to see, fam. There's an invitation on the screen. It'll appear soon. And it's blank there. But you should see your name in there. It's yours. It's your invitation. Your name is on that card. Will you come? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there's something so compelling to what you taught us this morning. There's something so compelling about how other you are and how beautiful this yoke and this burden is. Yet Jesus, there's something inside of us that causes us to just don't believe you. And I want to pray against that in these moments. We see an invitation with our names. Please help us to courageously take that leap of faith and to say, yes, we'll do it. Because we see the invitation loud and clear today. Lord Jesus, you say that I will give you rest. You say that we will find rest. We know that rest is knowing that it is well. It is well with me and with my soul. As we sing this now, make it true in our lives. Make it true in our hearts. Make it true in our minds. All because of you, Lord Jesus. We pray that in your name.